Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to LST3 TTV, Reflecting on Violence. Um, I'm Anthony Collins, and I'm going to be taking you through the next 12 weeks on this complex, uh, interesting, and in some ways, um, challenging topic, but challenging it perhaps in different ways from the ways you expect. Okay, so this is week one now. Uh, and I'm going to, um, in this video, I'm going to give you the first topic, um, which is what is violence, in which we cover um, two prescribed readings, the one by James Gilligan um, and the one, other one by Elizabeth Stanko. So James Gilligan, how to think about violence, and Elizabeth Stanko, the meanings of violence. Uh, I'm gonna t so I'll give you some, a broad overview of like, like just to give you a kind of an introductory sketch of the, the way it's in which we need to frame certain questions when we look at the topic of violence. I'm also going to give you another short video, which is more about the course itself, which is about the technicalities of the course and what to expect, what the course contents, what the course assessments will look like, but that'll be separate from this video. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. Um, uh, what is violence? Um, now, it's an interesting question. Um, why are we even doing a course on violence? I mean, most places don't offer courses on violence. It's very unusual um, uh, for a, a, any program, um, whether it's criminology, legal studies, or other fields, to offer specific courses that are just about violence. And yet violence creeps into many other courses. It's, a, it's, it's not a thing you've never thought about before. Um, so why does it tend not to be a separate focus of study? Um, and one of the things that makes this question even more interesting to me is the question of, well, one of the things about violence is that people worry about it. Um, the, the kinds of things that people worry about, they, 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 they worry about being victims of certain kinds of violence. It's a, it's, it's a thing that, that, um, that changes the way people think about the world. They'll be like, oh, I don't want to watch that movie. It's too violent. It'll be too upsetting for me. Or, or um, they, I won't travel to that country because um, there, there's a lot of violent crime there. Or um, I don't want to walk by myself in that particular place at night because um, it could be dangerous. So in this way, violence kind of pervades our lives. Um, it's, a, it, 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 it's a topic that informs um, what we do, it informs decisions we make. But it does more than that. It's not just that we, that we think about the risks to ourselves. It does a whole lot of other things and it changes the way we think about other people, about groups of people, about places, um, about um, ourselves. Um, and I want to, us to find a way of exploring all of that, but also the, to, to find a way of saying, well, what is violence even? Um, and, and that will then lead us to a set of other questions. Well, well what are the underlying causes? How can we prevent it? Um, but before we even get to that, the strange question, what is violence? Which of course you already know the answer to, but bear with me, let's think about it some more. Um, okay, so the, one of the first points I want to make is that we don't just think about violence on its own. We think about violence um, in terms of um, it shaping our worlds in exactly the way that we we talked to we that, exactly the way that I've already talked about um, that sense of like where am I going to go what am I going to do who am I going to trust what am I going to worry about what precautionary steps am I going to take what what am I going to what movies am I going to watch all of those um, that we've already indicated um, and one of the things that it's worth doing is stopping at that point and saying okay so all of these things are sort of going on in the background right. But where are those ideas coming from? Where are our ideas that we already have about violence coming from? Um, and that really is a, is a much deeper question than it might at first seem. Um, certainly, one of the places it's coming from, and you'll be familiar with this idea already, is from the news media. The news media loves reporting on violence more than any other topic. Um, um, media analysts have, have shown that, 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 that violent crime is the most over-reported topic in, in the entire field of news media. Um, that means that the, the extent to which it's reported in relation to the extent to which it's actually happening in, in, out there in the world. 
okay? Um, but that's not the only place. There are other places we can get um, ideas about violence. Some of them are very informal. Some of them are kind of everyday conversation. We'll be chatting to a friend about something, or our, our parents will have, will have told us certain things like, oh, don't take candy from strangers, you know? Like, oh, that, that, that's a story about violence. That's a story about if you did that, someone could try and hurt you. Um, so it's everywhere. It's in those little pieces of everyday life. Um, but it's also in a formal body of academic research across many disciplines, like, like, like literally every discipline in the social sciences has got a, a body of research about, about violence. Um, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big and diverse topic. So we've got kind of news media doing its thing. We've got the kind of everyday life, like um, uh, everyday conversations, um, that blurring the sort of gap between media and everyday life and social media is like, what is social media saying about violence? And then we've got these kind of formal academic research traditions. And I want us to sort of look at these in, in uh, contrast and comparison. I don't just want to say, here's what we know in the academic research. This is what we know about the, na the, the nature of violence, the prevalence of violence, the causes of violence. I want us to look at all these things because most of our information doesn't come from that academic place. So I want to know where it comes from and, and what we do with it. Um, okay, so let's talk about the, the news media for a moment. And certainly one of the, uh, the, the big theoretical ideas that's relevant for us that you've already come into contact with is the notion of moral panics. And we're going to want to think about that again in this course. Okay, the news media, it does a particular thing. It doesn't just love focusing on violence. It loves focusing on the most extreme cases of violence. And some of you may already be um, familiar with this theory of newsworthiness that has been developed around how the media decides what's going to be a headline. And extreme violence makes really good headlines. Um, acts of extreme brutality, brutal family murders, um, uh, violent terrorism, those kinds of things, they, 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 those are the kind of things that generate headlines. Those are the kind of things that get, a, that, um, you know, that get at the top of the news. Um, and that does a particular thing because, because we're being exposed to news. Even if you don't you know, actually watch the news on TV or read the newspapers, you're being, you're being exposed to the news all the time. It's, it's shaping your social media interactions, shaping the kind of things that people um, sort of chat informally to each other about. Um, and the focus of the news on extreme cases of violence um, creates a kind of a sense that that is what's really going on in the world, that the world is really full of kind of crazed terrorists or, or um, psychopathic serial killers. Um, and we need to ask the question, well, is it really? Um, how, 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 how many homicides are actually caused by serial killers? How many, how many deaths um, are caused by, by terrorists? Um, we need to ask these questions uh, because these are answerable questions. But it's, but it's interesting. And what I, want, what I want you to start noticing is how certain r accounts of violence, certain representations of, of violence make you feel certain kind of anxiety. And to start noticing that in yourself, noticing what it is you worry about. Um, that's a critical issue in this course. Um, and one of the interesting things we want to say is, okay, well, we don't just want to know what you worry about. We want to know what you don't worry about. What kinds of violence don't you worry about? What kinds of violence are you just like, well, I never gave a thought to that. It doesn't affect what I do, what I think, what I feel. And that's as interesting. Um, the, the way in which certain risks kind of disappear, um, they become things we don't think about. Because they become things we don't think about, they become things we don't deal with. Um, versus the kind of things that we freak out about and, 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 and feel a lot of anxiety um, uh, in various contexts. Um, so I want you to be watching that. I want you to be seeing like, well, what is the media doing? And part of this course, is actually paying attention to the media. That's, that's like a literal um, course requirement in as much as another course might give you your set of required readings. One of your required activities for this course is that you need to follow the news media's um, accounts of, of, of violence. 
um, because we're going to talk about that all the time and you need to know what I'm referring to. Okay, now, um, one of the, th the, 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 um, the ways of understanding the news media specifically is by looking at what the news media is trying to do. Um, because there's something it's not trying to do. And this, and this is also a thing that social media is not trying to do. Social media and the news media are not trying to give you a neutral, um, uh, accurate version of what the world is like. And you should never sort of fall into the assumption that, that's, that, 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 they, are, that they are neutral, trustworthy, reliable sources of information. Um, different media um, are, are trustworthy in different ways. Certainly reputable news media try to verify their information. They try to verify their stories. Uh, social media is just anything goes. Any, anyone can make up any bullshit and turn it into like a posting, a meme, some nonsense, uh, some claim uh, for scientific finding when no such scientific finding exists. I mean, the, the, the defining feature of social media is fake news and the extent to which um, that has become a very, very powerful way in which the kind of sense of reality is produced by, for people. But one of the sort of traditional um, slogans in newsrooms and journalists were, were sent out to get stories and editors were deciding what they're going to prioritize as stories is, is there's, there's this interesting journalistic phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. And this is simply saying, like, if there is, if there's violence, if there are, if they like, especially visual images or, 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 or gory accounts of, 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 of people being injured and killed, then those are going to be the lead stories in the newspapers. And of course, those of you who have done your um, course in victimology will know that um, one of the things going on there is that it's, it's not just that the media go after these kind of extreme cases of violence, these sort of headline grabbing, shocking accounts, is that they really love stories with innocent victims. They really love stories with um, children, with uh, vulnerable people, um, uh, people who, who, are, who are innocent, people who are just doing normal everyday things like sitting in their home watching TV or going to do their shopping and then get and then be suddenly become victims of terrible violence. Um, and um, you'll be aware of that, um, that theory of the ideal victim if you've studied victimology. If not, it's uh, something definitely worth exploring. Um, so the medium. The media is not about trying to understand violence. The media is about selling a product. They, they, are in the, they are in the business of selling media. They're in the business of getting your clicks, of making you change channels on TV, of selling their newspapers and magazines. Um, and that's what drives their versions of, of violence. And, 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 and because of that, that shapes what violence they choose to, to focus on and how they tell those stories, okay? Unfortunately, what ends up happening is that those are the stories that surround us and those are the stories that, that feel real to us. They feel like, oh my God, this is what's happening in the world. Uh, people are doing this crazy stuff. Um, uh, and in fact, it, it isn't necessarily so. There can be a massive gap. Not that the facts are not, uh, are, are, are not accurate, not like, oh, you know, this father didn't come home from work and kill his wife and three children. It's not that that didn't happen. It's why that story, and why is that story told in that way? Why is the story told in terms of certain things? Oh, he had a, he had a history of mental illness, or oh, his neighbors report that he was just a lovely, friendly person who always um, greeted them and was always helpful. There's, there's always a way of telling the story, okay? At the same time, there's also always a story that isn't told, you know? If the story of, the, of the, the husband who comes home and kills his wife and children grabs the headlines, then the story of the husband next door who is verbally abusive to his wife, continually undermines her self-worth, makes her depressed and feel helpless, and occasionally... Um, uh, slaps her in the face. That story doesn't get into the media, but that is a story of violence. 
Um, and perhaps it's a, in some ways a more important story of violence because it's a much, much more common one. So looking at the media, you're going to get that one extreme story and, you, and, and the other story is going to be hidden from you. We need to think about this. We need to think about how this shapes our understanding of the world, our understanding of each other, and our understanding of, of the problem of violence. The other thing the media does is it goes, it, it trends. Like something becomes a trending topic in the media. Um, 2019, 2018-2019, uh, Me Too movement suddenly became a trending um, issue in violence. The, the, the violence against women, the violence um, uh, of, of sexual harassment, of sexual assault became a trending topic that had, that had been totally underreported before that. 2020, um, Black Lives Matter, the, the violence of, of the US police um, against African Americans became a huge topic um, for a while. And then the media sort of tapered off after a couple of months, um, despite being a massive social issue. Um, so, so the media does that. Suddenly it's this month, it's um, pedophile priests in the, in the Catholic Church. That month it, uh, it's police brutality. Then it's family violence. The media, the media kind of gets the idea like, oh, we've, th this is a topic that, that's getting a lot of, a lot of hits. Um, and, so, and, and so we get a sense of that, like, that the world's kind of suddenly changing, like, like oh my God, American police are, are, are just killing people. Well, they've always been killing people. There's nothing new about that. They've been doing that for 100 years. Um, it's just that the media decided to trend on that topic this um, past year. Um, so we need to think about that. Um, and especially we need to think about how that sort of then interlinks with social media. And social media where there's even less regulation, at least the media most sort of traditional media outlets have a reputation to manage. If they're caught just lying again and again, people will be like, well, you can't trust that. But social media, anyone can post anything and make any claim about it, make it look like it's based on evidence when it's just rubbish. Um, and so there's just no control over the truthfulness of claims um, on most social media. Um, certainly, you know, there are, you know, Facebook occasionally fact checks things. There are websites like Snopes that you can go to and say, is this story really true? Uh, and, and, and someone will have done detailed research to try and verify. But, but even if you can check the specific claims or story, you can't check the context that easily. You can't say, well, well why is the media telling me this story? And why is it not telling me other stories? Um, and that's the um, important thing that we need to understand. The other thing is not all of it is from the news. A lot of how we think um, about violence has actually come from things that we know are fictionalized. They come from movies, uh, Netflix, you know, t TV series. It's a common theme. Uh, two most common themes in any TV series is romance and violence. It's either a love story or it's an action story. Um, action stories generally, actually, that's a, that's a code word for violence, right? Um, it's a story, um, and, 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 and they tell these stories in a particular way. So you'll have a story, um, and even these sort of these quasi-documentary-ish things, um, you know, criminal minds type um, programs. Um, then, and, 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 and certainly the very influential programs like CSI, which, uh, which represent crime and criminology and crime investigations in certain ways that don't necessarily have anything to do with um, reality. Um, and when you look at these, these stories, what's interesting about them is they explain violence in certain ways. What we've already talked about um, now, we've talked about that they focus on certain types of violence oh they'll focus on the family murder not on the on the 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 the, the, the verbal abuse in the family for instance but they'll also theorize that violence and not in the sense of saying oh you know uh, james gilligan's book um reflecting on a national epidemic claims this about violence they never do it that way the the theory of violence is always in the story it's like this serial killer 
um, and we see what he's doing and we and then we start seeing his flashbacks and the flashbacks take us back to his childhood and we see that in his childhood he was treated abusively by his parents so it's and it's all in that story but in that story is a theory there is a theory about how a person becomes violent there's a theory of psychological trauma um, changing someone's capacity for empathy, filling them with uh, unconscious rage. I mean, it's a very complicated uh, psychological theory that, that psychological researchers will research and debate uh, the, the, the merits and demerits of that story. But, but, but it's not told to you as such. It's, they never say, oh, here's a theory. They just say, here's a story. And as you're watching that story, a theory is being built in your head. Like, oh, why, why do people become terrorists? Why do people become radicalized? Who, who, who are terrorists? People of a particular religion, is that who, is that who becomes terrorists? Um, anarchists? Um, white supremacists? Who, who are these terrorists? Um, well, how did they become terrorists? Uh, is it just that people from that social group are kind of crazy and don't have compassion and, and are impulsively violent? Or is it something else? Um, so, so all of these ideas are being thrown around all the time. Um, and that's the interesting thing is that, is that we are, we are being, we, we're not only being given accounts of what violence is happening, we are also all the time being given these hidden accounts of why it is happening. And that's really interesting. We're always being told, but not explicitly, we're being told in a kind of hidden way oh, this is why, this is why I became a serial killer. This is why she became a terrorist. Um, all of those things um, are, those messages are coming through, but they're not being acknowledged. We're just sort of getting them in a covert, intuitive way, but they're shaping how we think. Um, and that's really, really significant. Okay. Now, I want to have a look at this, the first reading for the course, which is called How to Think About Violence, um, from a book by James Gilligan called Violence Reflections on a National Epidemic. I highly recommend this book or any other of James Gilligan's writing. Okay, Gilligan is a, is a, a, a US American psychiatrist, and he spent most of his life working in the prison system there. So, he, so his work was, is with the most violent offenders, like people who are, you know, not just people who'd like committed a mugging, people who committed very serious multiple homicides, a serial rape, um, people who are, are spending a lot of time in, a, in, in, the, in the United States prison system. And he spent his time trying to understand how they'd gotten there and what was going on with them. And specifically, he was working mainly with men. And that's a question we'll deal with in later weeks. What, what's the connection between men and violence? So, so Gilligan, Gilligan's looking at, these, looking at these men and trying to understand why did they end up uh, ruining their lives and ruining other people's lives? Why did they end up committing these violent offenses? And the other question he's really interested in is, and why do they keep doing it? Like once they're in jail, they carry on being violent. They assault other prisoners. They assault the guards. They end up being put in solitary confinement, having their privileges taken away, not being given parole. They just keep being violent and self-destructive. And, and, it, and no, it doesn't help anyone. It certainly doesn't help them. So what's going on? Anyway, so the, this whole book of his, Violence Reflections on the National Epidemic, it's kind of about that. It's kind of about, about how people become very repetitively violent. It's also a book about men, about masculinities, about what's really going on inside kind of men that, that, that have such difficulty managing certain things. Um, okay, but in this particular chapter, he's giving us just a very broad overview uh, he's framing a problem about violence. And one of the things he's framing is the question that I was just telling you about, is that I was saying that, you know, there are all these stories of violence, these Netflix series, whatever, they, they're giving us these kind of hidden theories. Um, and, and Gilligan's first point, and this is a point I want to make very strongly, is not only do you already have an idea of what violence is? You already, if I, if I ask you the question, and, 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 and this is actually a question that you, you must ask yourself this week, this is part of your work for this week. Um, 
give me what are examples of violence so when i say to you okay give me three examples of violence what what are the three things that pop into your head like just the most obvious ones like three examples of violence um and then what might jump into your head well think about it okay murder that that's one of the big ones that comes out of people murder like uh, someone killing someone else that is that is the classic version of violence um, um another um sexual assault rape that that's a very common one a difficult topic um but uh but for for many people that's a real thing like yeah that's a that's a it's a huge social problem it's a big risk um and it's a such a destructive and useless kind of crime um Another example beyond that, uh, um, getting mugged, uh, you know, some pulling a knife on you and wanting your, your money and your phone. Um, so, you know, different kinds of examples would jump out to different people. But, but we all have this sense. And some of us may say, well, um, being bullied at school might be a kind of violence or, or violence in a relationship, uh, intimate partner violence, um, or, or terrorism, or, or war between countries. Um, or persecution of minorities, uh, uh, Chinese Uyghurs, um, uh, genocide. I mean, all, all these different things. And each of us might have a slightly different version of what jumps out as a, at, at us as, as the kind of violence we would worry about. Um, but I want you to notice that, that you, you already have an idea of what violence is. And this is the interesting part of it. You have an idea of what violence isn't. Because in each of those things, when you think of, oh, this is violent, this is violent, then there's a, there's a whole lot of things where, where you're not thinking the thought consciously, but you, but you are looking at a thing and saying, no, no, that's not violence. And where we draw that line, this is violence that is not violent. That's really interesting. And I want us to talk about that a lot in this course. What is the boundary between what is violence and what is not violence? Okay. But let's get back to Gilligan. Here's a quote. Our choice is not between having a theory of violence or not having one. It is between having a conscious theory, which we can examine, question, criticize, and improve, or an unconscious theory, which will remain forever untested, neither provable nor disprovable, and therefore unimprovable. Okay, so what's he saying? He's saying you already have theories of violence in your head. You've always, you've, you've had them since you were young. You already think, oh, you know, people rape because of this. People become terrorists because of that. People become serial killers because of that. People become uh, school bullies because of this. Um, you've, got, you've got these kind of ideas. You, don't, you probably don't know where they came from. Not only that, you don't actually know that you have them. Like if someone said to you, what's your theory of violence? And you're like, I don't really have a theory of violence. Actually, you do. You have multiple theories of violence. You are just not aware of them. That's what Gilligan's getting at. You already have theories of violence. You already have theories about why someone might pull a knife on you and want to take your money and your phone. You're just not sure. You just don't consciously articulate that theory. And you, and, and you probably don't know where that theory came from and why you have it. So Gilligan says, and this is my starting point of the course. This is why we're focusing on this theory. He says, you've got a theory of violence already. The problem is you don't know what it is and you don't know where it came from. And because of that, this is the critical thing. Because you, you're not conscious of it, because you don't know where it came from, you can't check whether it's true. That's the point. You can't check whether your own theories of violence um, are accidents that were constructed by what your parents said, what your religious organization said, what the media said. Um, you, and, and you can't check it and say, wait, is that true? Is it true that, um, that um, you know, if that people who experience child abuse are at a high risk of becoming serial killers? Is it pe true that people who are religious fundamentalists of certain faith have a, have a high risk of becoming terrorists? Are, are these things true? Where did those ideas come from? 
Um, and this is Gilligan's point. We need to work out what we already believe. The stuff we believe that we aren't aware that we believe. That's what he wants us to do. And that's what I want to do in this course first. I first want to say, what is it you already think? What is it you already know? Where did those ideas come from? Um, and I don't just want to run to the scientific readings and say, okay, this is what researchers actually know. This is what they've shown to be true. Yeah, we can do that, but that's, that, that's to, before we do that, we've got to do other things. We've got to work out how our emotions became linked to certain ideas and why people sort of are pulled to certain explanations that make a kind of sense before we just talk about what researchers believe and what they don't believe. Because researchers' ideas also come from somewhere. Researchers don't just kind of exist in a vacuum. They exist in a social world where the ideas are, are, are also informed by the common sense, uh, cultural values, media, things like that. The difference is they try and test those ideas. That's the only difference is they'd say, yeah, I, I've, I've got a hunch that this is probably the reason that happens. And then they say, well, let's see whether that's really true. And they set up a research project to check it out. Okay. So... We've got, we've got ideas of violence, we've got theories of violence, but we need to be more conscious of them because, so that we can check whether they are really true or that, whether they're just things that we happen to believe. Um, if we just happen to believe them, the problem is they may not have the consequences we want, that the, our theories of violence may end up harming us. Um, if our theory of violence is that what we need to, to do about the problem of homicide is bring back the death penalty, um, if we believe that and, it's, and, and we create sort of political pressure and bring back the death penalty, and it turns out that's not true, that in fact the death penalty may have no impact or in fact increase homicide rate, we've actually done ourselves a, a harm, a disservice. Um, if, we, you know, if we believe that um, the, the way to prevent your children being sexually assaulted is to not let them go to public parks, but to let them... Uh, be in the care of extended family members, members of your faith-based organization. Um, and that turns out not to be true. And it turns out that, in fact, youth organizations, formal respected youth organizations, tend to be infiltrated by pedophiles. Um, then you've made a mistake and you've put your family at risk. That's why we need to know these things. We need to know what the consequences of our beliefs are. Um, are our beliefs actually harming each other and harming ourselves, even though the whole point of them is to try and protect ourselves and to protect the people we care about? Okay, so, th so this is a big question. Okay, the next thing Gilligan talks about is he says one of the most traditional ways of talking about violence is in kind of moral terms. That what do we know about hurting people is bad. That's it. That, that's, that, that's the most like universal traditional claim about violence. Hurting people is bad. You shouldn't do it. People who hurt other people, people who, who assault and murder and rape, they, 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 those are bad things to do. And people do them because they're bad people. And he says, that's a really interesting bit of logic. Okay, sure, they're bad things to do. Hurting people is bad. Great, let's all get on board. I think that's a fairly reasonable starting point. But this kind of traditional idea, which is really a kind of theological idea, that, 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 that people do bad stuff because they're bad people. Um, and when we stop and look at that, it's like, yeah, what do you mean? Um, how do you know that someone's bad? Oh, because they did bad stuff. Okay. But the, you're just saying that they're a person who did bad stuff. There's, the, you're not saying anything about the circumstances, the motivations, the, the, the causes, the context. You're, not a, you, you, you're just really restating your point. To say that someone is bad because they did bad stuff, you might as well just say they did bad stuff. You're not, you're not adding anything explanatory or insightful that enables you to do something. And the interesting thing with that line of thought is, is, is the, 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 the conclusion that follows from that is, um, therefore, they should be punished. Um, they did bad stuff. They're a bad person. We should punish them. 
And this is kind of, this is a deep, deep kind of common sense, um, tra very traditional kind of way of thinking about violence, okay? Um, so someone is bad, they need to be punished. That's what our sense of justice is all about. And lo and behold, that's kind of what our entire criminal justice system is about, is about, you know, catching baddies and punishing them, making them suffer for having made other people suffer. But is that really how violence works? Um, does punishing people really stop them from being violent? Does it stop other people from being violent? Does it make people say, oh, I better not, I better not murder this person because this other guy did and he's in jail now? Is, is, it, is, 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 is that kind of deterrence effective? Is our need for justice saying like that, that person, that was a, that was a awful, cruel, ghastly thing to do and that person should suffer for having done that. That, that, that idea of, of, of kind of vengeance, of, of balancing, balancing the, the horrible thing one person did by doing a horrible thing back to them. Is that an effective way of, of, of managing violence in society? These are real questions. We need to answer them. Um, okay, so Gilligan says, one of our theories, we've got that kind of, that theological theory that uh, bad people do bad things and they need to be punished. And he's like, well, that's just bullshit. Um, firstly, because it's incoherent. It doesn't actually make any claim that is meaningful. Secondly, it doesn't work. If there's one thing we know in the, in, in the entire study of violence in human society going back thousands of years, there's one thing we know is that is that punishing people is not an effective way of reducing violence. That is historically established. So he's like, okay, you can explore that in more depth in your own time, but that, that idea, that is a problem. It's not an effective violence intervention strategy. We've tried it, it's failed. Okay, so let's look a little bit deeper. He says, there's another really interesting theory that's getting knocked around here. Rational self-interest theory is what he calls it, okay? And this is essentially the idea that people, people are essentially rational, they have goals, they have desires, and they work out how to achieve those goals, okay? That people are kind of, um, they are rational, uh, self-interested, calculating um, agents. And, it's, and, and this assumes that people are primarily rational. They, that they clearly understand what their goals are, they make, they make plans to achieve those goals. And this applies to everything. It applies to why you are studying at university. Um, it applies to the, you know, why you put on makeup in the morning, whatever. But it applies to why people do violence. Uh, and this theory proposes that people are violent because they gain something from it. And so that's it. You know, the car pulls a knife on you. He wants your money and your phone. Um, that's why he's violent. Um, he, he threatens you. He breaks into the, you know, the, the, the home invader breaks into your house to steal your stuff because they, they gain something from it. They want to sell your TV. They want to steal your laptop. Okay? That's why people do it. Um, if people are violent because they gain something from it, they're violent for material gain. Then the intervention logically is very simple. We bring in a punishment that outweighs the gain. So we say, yeah, sure, you can get like 200 bucks selling that guy's phone, but we're gonna put you in jail for seven years. So it's just not worth it. It's just not worth pulling a knife on someone and making them. Just not worth breaking into someone's house and threatening them with a weapon, taking their car keys and stealing their car. Um, it's, just, it's just not worth it. It's not worth it um, killing someone for the life insurance policy because we're going to put you in jail for 25 years if you do that. So this is like a, people are violent because they rationally calculate that they've got something to gain from it. And what we need to do is to say to them, wait a minute, you need to add in your calculation the possibility of punishment. So yes, you may get a million dollars from the life insurance policy, but you're going to sit in jail for 25 years and you're not going to get, get to spend that money. So it's a simple, you know, cost benefit analysis. And, and what this theory does is it emphasizes punishment and our, and, and our, and our entire justice system 
really emphasizes punishment. Um, you know, the police, the courts, the prisons, this is about punishing people for doing bad things, it's about other things too. But one of the things it's about is about punishing people for doing bad stuff. But if we, if we accept that system and we say, okay, what we're going to do, you, you violent because of, uh, that you're trying to achieve a goal, we're going to give you a counter um, uh, consequence that outweighs the positive. We're going to give you a negative consequence that outweighs the positive consequence. Therefore, people are going to stop being violent. Um, and this becomes what we do. So a country like Australia spends $16 billion a year on uh, police courts and prisons. I mean, 16 billion, that is, that, is a, that is a big, big part of the national budget, okay? Um, on this system that is really kind of built on this disincentive model, it's built on, a, on largely, not entirely, but largely on a punishment model. And the public support it largely because they believe that punishment model. Okay, so all this money is spent on this model that's kind of built sort of unconsciously on the rational self-interest kind of deterrence, punishment outweighing the gain model. And what th that, that's not the issue. The issue is what is money then not being spent on? What is $16 billion not being spent on? And what it's not being spent on, and it's not that no money is being spent on, that some money is, but not that money. It's not being spent on understanding the underlying causes of those acts of violence. It's not spent on understanding the psychological, the social, the economic um, causes of those problems. And it's not being spent on prevention. That the more we think about punishment, the less we think about prevention. And this is the problem for Gilligan. This is why it says we've really gone down the wrong road with violence. Our criminal justice, rational self-interest, punitive-based model is, is, a, is, a, is a disaster because what it's done is it's made, it's, it's put all of our money, all of our energy, all of our training as criminologists, as lawyers, as uh, all those, the entire set of, of, of skills into a system based on, on, on punishment and not into a system based on prevention, not into a system that looks at why did this thing happen? R really, why did it happen? Not like, oh, the person had something to gain, like deep, in kind of a deep analysis, why did it happen? And what could we do to change those underlying conditions? Um, and that is what he wants us to think about. Okay, I'm going to stop there um, because watching these videos can get quite long. I have not yet finished the, the first lecture, um, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to, make this the end of part one and I'm going to continue with part two then that you can watch separately.